Well, good morning. Uh, it's good to have you here this morning. And well, this morning, um, I had Jeff read the backdrop um, to the passage that we're going to read. And the passage that we're going to read, I'll put it mildly, is pretty challenging. And it's about women's roles in the church. And now, as I was preparing for this sermon, a few thoughts came to mind. And I'll, let, I'll share them with you. Number one, save it for Scott when he goes back from sabbatical and let him take it. <laughs> but then I thought it was assigned to me, and why can't I just trust God to preach it? Number two, maybe I should just read a resignation letter instead. Uh, but then I thought, you know, God hasn't called me out of here yet, so uh, he clearly has me here to, to teach us this morning. Or the third one is to have my wife come up and preach it. Now, if you understand the passage... That would, everything I'm going to say today goes directly opposite of that, so that's a joke. So anyway, those are the three things. So, but anyway, that's where we are this morning, and we're excited um, to look at God's Word, and I hope you are as well. Well, just to give a quick recap, we're in the book of 1 Corinthians, and as Paul has been challenging the church on how to use their spiritual gifts to edify the body, or basically to build up the people of the church in order to worship God. All of our gifts must be grounded with the motive of what? What was chapter 13 all about? Love. love. Got mo everything's with the motive of love. Well, these past couple of weeks, we've been talking about specific spiritual gifts in the context of a worship service. Well, last week, Will over here talked about the plan for worship, how we're called to edify in worship, prioritizing truth, um, and also orderly worship, because we have God is a God of order and not of confusion. Well, Today, Paul talks about the role of women in the service, and I have to, in the worship service. And I have to warn you, if you haven't read the passage yet, it's a bit striking, at least at first glance. We will read these verses, and maybe you'll even shake your head and wonder, um, how could all this be true? But let me remind you that this is God's word, and all of his word is truth and without error. And maybe there's something here this morning that God wants to teach you and teach me. So I want to take time right now to commit this morning to the Lord. So let's go before him and pray. Oh, Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. And we know your word is truth, and it is life. So I pray for this morning that our hearts and minds will be open to hear from you. And Lord, speak to us and uh, challenge us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let's read the passage. As uh, Jeff alluded to, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, uh, verses 33b through 35. And I'll also be reading from the New American Standard Version. So if you want to look, turn there. 1 Corinthians 14. Let's start there. As in all the churches of the saints, the women are to keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but are to subject themselves just as the law also says. If they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is improper for a woman to speak in church. Wow, yeah, wow, some powerful stuff. Now, maybe you might be your first reaction, this seems harsh or maybe a little degrading to women, but what are we tempted to do when we get to a hard or tough passage? What can we do? Well, there's four th things, wrong ways that we can interpret scripture, so when we approach challenging passages, here are the four ways that what we shouldn't do. Number one, dismiss it as untruth, or at least not for today. You know, this was in the past in a different context, more of a patriarchal society, it doesn't apply to today. Number two, we may completely skip or ignore the passage because we don't understand it. Number three, we may take a text like this and use it as an excuse to reject all of God's teaching. This seems contradictory to other parts of scripture, so it can't be true. And then none of God's word is true. And then fourth, maybe we project our feelings toward difficult scriptures onto God's character, and we make wrong assumptions about his motives. Well, God must think less of women, and if he's going to limit women, I don't want any part of him. So those are four wrong ways to do it, but there is a right way. And if we pray for wisdom and insight to see that God is trying to teach us, and that's where we are today. We're not running away, but we're going to dive in and see what God has to teach us about that. And I'm really thankful for a church and elders um, that encourage us to teach through all of Scripture and not just pick and choose passages. So you guys ready? Dive in? Let's go. Well, in order to dive in, there's three important study tools that help us understand meaning. And these three things are gonna be huge for the, service, the sermon today. Number one, 
we identify the immediate scriptural context. Where are these verses located in the, uh, that passage, that specific passage? Number two, we research the historical context. What was taking place at that time when it was written? And number three, we consider the to total teaching of scripture on this specific subject or topic. I'm telling you, if you utilize these three tools, no matter when you're studying the Bible, it's going to help you understand <laughs> scripture a lot more and just understand the whole context. So let's go on. Number one, the immediate scriptural context. These verses sit right in the middle of Paul's instructions for an orderly worship service. Things weren't going right in the Corinthian church. There was confusion. People were speaking out of turn, even speaking in tongues with no interpretation so others could not understand. People were competing to use their gifts, basically to build themselves up rather than to build the church up. Paul's reminder to them is that God is a God of order, not a God of confusion. And in verse 40 in this chapter, Paul summarizes it all with, but all things should be done decently and in order. So basically, Paul is essentially confronting the chaos in the worship service. So that's number one. That's the immediate scriptural context. Number two is the historical context. That's another important tool. Well, a few months back, Pastor Scott, he gave us a great uh, summary of the historical context of what he's writing. So let's review what he had so talked about. Paul's writing of 1 Corinthians came at a time when Christianity was really upsetting the ancient Roman system. Back then, your status was determined by whether you were a slave or you were free, you're a citizen or you're a foreigner, you're poor, you're rich, you're a man, you're a woman. And some of those identifications put you at the bottom of the social order. You were treated very poorly as a slave or a foreigner or a poor man or a, a woman. But when Jesus came, he flipped that all upside down. Now Christians worship a savior that treated women like human beings. Jesus treated women with dignity and respect and demonstrated their worth by his relationships with them. Jesus even allowed women to be part of his ministry, participate in it. Some traveled with him, some supported him financially. And then if you really think back to the highlight reel of Jesus' life, I mean, his whole life is a highlight reel, but some specific moments. You think about his birth in a manger, the scene at the cross, the empty tomb, his resurrection appearance in the upper room. The Bible specifically highlights the presence of women and their significance in those events. And then after Christ returned to heaven, Paul wrote in the book of Galatians, there is neither Jew or Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. In Christ, all social barriers were erased. So you might imagine how different the early church was. All this would have been exciting, but it also could have been very chaotic, because women were now allowed in the worship service. Maybe for the first time they were treated as sisters, with equal worth and value before God. Excited with this new freedom, maybe they hadn't considered any boundaries to guide their freedom. So we just looked at the first. What was the first one? The immediate cult scriptural context, and now the second one was the historical context. Now we're going to look at number three, the total teaching of scripture on this topic as we walk through the verses. So now we'll get back to the 1 Corinthians chapter 14. As in all the churches of the saints, the women are to keep silent in the churches. Now notice here what Paul is saying. All the churches of the saints, the women are to keep silent in the church. This applies to all churches and not just for the local Corinthian church with a few outspoken women. Paul deemed this issue important enough to apply to everyone. And so it is to our benefit to take this command or instruction very seriously. Let's read on. The women are to keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak. Now what does that mean? Are women allowed to talk? Can they even make a sound? And why not? Well, I'm going to do a quick definition uh, of the meaning of the Greek word laleo. In classical Greek, laleo could be used to mean to talk or to chatter. But in the New Testament, it's more of a dignified word meaning to speak, as in all speaking. So if we take it at face value, this prohibition against women speaking is not just about having women, like having small talk in the pews, but rather any kind of speaking in the church service. Well, now, if we hear it that way, if this is the Greek meaning, how does this fit with the rest of Scripture on the subject? Well, it does speak to it. A few chapters earlier, in chapter 11, 
Paul states, but every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head, for she is one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved. So we see right here, Paul permitted women to pray and prophesy as long as they did it with the proper head coverings and did not dishonor their husbands. So if Paul is allowing praying and prophesying a few paragraphs earlier in his letter, would he really be contradicting himself by right now and saying, hey, they shouldn't talk at all? Well, there's three main views on how people put 1 Corinthians 11 and 1 Corinthians 14 together. And so we're going to look at these three views, because they maybe on the surface seem like they're contradictory to one another, but this is how they put them together. There's three. The three are one is that Paul allows speaking but doesn't approve of it. Number two, it's a different setting, different context. And then number three is that certain roles require authority. So let's look at the first one. Paul allows but doesn't approve. This view stems from when Moses regulated divorce. You know, if you guys remember in the New Testament, the Pharisees tried to stump Jesus and they asked Jesus, why did Moses regulate divorce if God did not approve of it? Jesus responded that regulation was really due to the people's hardness of heart. Moses regulated divorce to prevent abuse. So right here, Paul could be regulating women prophesizing, but that if the women are going to do it, they need to do it with a proper attire, like appropriate signs of authority. In essence, it was allowance, but rather than approval. Now, personally, I don't think this is the strongest argument, because why wouldn't Paul have just said that in chapter 11, hey, women, don't do that? Why would he have allowed it at all? So that's, I, don't, I personally don't hold a lot of weight to that one. Number two, the different setting view. This view is that Paul's teaching in chapter 11 does not refer to prayer and prophesying in a church service, but while chapter 14 is specifically talking about a church service, the view emphasizes the setting, either service, in the service or not in the service. So you're going to see a couple slides up here, just the idea here, hear it out. In chapter 11, after Paul discusses women praying and prophesying, he then starts with these words, when you come together. So it would seem that chapter 11 could be in the context of activity outside of the worship service. But then in chapter 14, verses 23 and 26, uses those same words, when you come together. So chapter 14 is specifically talking about a worship service. I believe this view has merit to it, as there is a big difference between casual settings and the church worship service. So women could speak at a casual gathering, but maybe not in a formal church service. And there's other parts in the New Testament that emphasize women that prophesy. We look at Acts that are outside the worship settings. Acts 2.17. It says, And it shall be in the last days, and go to the end, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Also in Acts 21, when Paul himself met prophecies in Caesarea. Now, verse 9. Now this man had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. So in both of these situations... There were, there's no mention of a formal worship service, and so women were allowed to speak. Now, we can put all these pieces together and probably agree that there has been different expectations for, different, for women in different settings. Now, the third view, how do you bring the third view together? Well, they bring chapter 11 and 14 and says that women could speak in the service, but only in certain ways. And this view relies heavily on the immediate context. Paul has been dis discussing prophecy with the weighing and judging of prophecy. You guys get that? Someone would come up and speak, say a prop prophesy. Will William talked about that last couple weeks. And then they could get two, maybe three people could get up and basically validate what the person was saying. Whether it's true, whether it's not true. That's what he's talking about here. For a woman to stand up and weigh prophecy would be an exercise of authority. And so it's possible Paul is talking specifically of women being silent in this way. Paul is forbidding women from judging prophecies publicly in a worship service because such an activity would subvert male headship. Now, I, while I believe the second view has, is, is true, considering the setting, I also think this third view helps us interpret this scripture the most. This view elevates the underlying concept of male headship and women's roles within the church setting. And now you might be asking me, or maybe you're totally confused, that's okay, too. Why can't a woman have the authoritative role versus a man? Well, you know what? You think it's in Scripture? 
It is. Sorry. Well, scripture is not silent on this either. Paul goes on in, in verse 34. But are to subject themselves, just as the law also says. Let's talk about that term, subjecting themselves. In the New English translation, it also means in submission to. In the King James, it says in obedience to. So in our culture, as women reading this, the bristle comes when women are commanded to submit or subject themselves to someone else. I mean, none of us like it. <laughs> but this is really a command to willingly surrender. A willingness to allow someone else to have authority over you. And hear this first. First and foremost, since God is the author of the law, he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, mind, and strength. So the surrender is ultimately to him, to God himself. Hear that again. Who are we surrendering to first? To God himself. And because he is the creator and author, he has a design in the created order. The idea of submission is nothing new. Back in chapter 11, Paul made a point to emphasize the creation account in Genesis 2. God created Adam and gave him dominion or authority over creation. God then created woman by taking her out of the man to be a suitable helper for him. She is literally God's gift to man. Woman is made within a specific created order for a specific design and purpose. So listen to this. Does this mean that women are less than men? Absolutely not. God created men and women equally in his image, but with different roles. Equal, but different. We hear from our culture that different means inequality, but God meant for differences to be celebrated and lived out in the roles that we play as men and women. Paul speaks to this in chapter 11. However, in the Lord, neither is woman independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as the woman originates from the man, so also the man has his birth through the woman, and all things originate from God. God's design was to create man and woman to work together with the man as the head and the woman as the complementary helper, ultimately together bringing God glory. And this pattern of headship continues into marriage. While marriage is introduced in Genesis 2, Paul continues this idea of submission in Ephesians 5. Verse 22 of Ephesians 5. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. So it should not surprise us that, as Paul highlights this male headship in our passage today, he goes on in verse Corinthians 14, If they, talking about women, desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is improper for a woman to speak in church. If you have a question, ask your husband at home. Talk about it there. Think about it. If a woman had a comment or asked a question in the worship service, not only would it be disruptive, but it could appear to dishonor her husband. Paul is not saying it's improper for women to think or to have ideas or ask questions. That's all great, but I believe his instruction is for the demonstration of God's created order for men and women. Now, guys, talking about women here, I want to talk to you. There's a challenge embedded in this verse as leaders of our home and shepherds of our family. If our wives have questions or comments, are we available to listen? Are we prepared to answer their questions or thoughts? Are we studying God's word, maybe on our own, to be able to lead our wives closer to Christ? Conversing with our wives about spiritual things is such an important part of a vital marriage. And I'm not suggesting that you have to have all the answers, but you're willing to be approachable and research the questions and comments together. You know what? Ultimately, God's going to hold us responsible for our families. So how we lead and how we shepherd them. And for the women here that may not be married, what do you do with your questions or comments? Scripturally, your authority is still your father. But if, if your father is not in a position to answer your questions or comments, look to your pastors, elders, small group leaders to help you in that way. And now let's get back to 1 Corinthians 14, where Paul closes with this. For it is improper for a woman to speak in church. Other translations use the word shameful or disgraceful instead of improper. 
for it is shameful or disgraceful for a woman to speak in church. Why would Paul use such a strong word to emphasize his point? Remember before how we talked about the historical context earlier? Well, it's pretty important right here. It's the same language that Paul used in chapter 11 to describe a woman cutting her hair. A woman wore a sign of submission to authority when she prayed or prophesied. In the time when Paul wrote this, women had long hair and men short hair. So the long hair represented their submission. To have short hair would have been shameful in that Roman Greek society. This is the same context that Paul is speaking to right here. If a woman came up and spoke up in a public assembly, it would have been considered shameful at that time. But hear this too. Paul is not giving license to make it shameful for women to speak at all. In no way does this passage give permission to men to abuse women or use their position of headship in manipulative ways. The headship of man does not diminish women's worth, but rather Christ-centered headship of man and women's willing submission is a testimony to God's perfect design. Well, what do we do with these verses here in church at PBC? This, can, what's the woman's role here at PBC? We know that women's roles are vital here, but do we have specific roles for men only? And we sure do. Because our church ordains only men for the office of pastor, elder, or deacon. We follow the teaching of scripture that specifically give these, gives these roles to men. Now, I'm not going to read these scriptures, but you can see them up here. But notice that all these offices I just talked about are only given to men. And then the passages go on and talk about um, character traits, traits that these men must possess. As you can see, all these places here, Titus and Timothy, that talk about men in these roles. Well, Paul also explicitly states in 1 Timothy 2, But I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. For it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve. Because of these scriptural mandates, we don't have women teaching or preaching over men. We view teaching or preaching as an aspect of exercising authority. We believe God's word is authoritative, true, and very clear on this issue. However, there are many gifted women that are gifted teachers and possess the spiritual gift of teaching. What should they do with that? Well, the Bible gives us some examples in how women can serve within the church. The book of Titus discuss discusses this even using the term teaching. This is Titus chapter 2, verse 3. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. You know what? My wife is a great teacher. And uh, to be frank, many times she can do circles around me. She's used her gift to teach other women. She's taught many students over the years. And you know how well she uses the gift of teaching? She helps me. We've had many discussions, um, all the talks I'm doing with youth ministry or small groups, um, and even my sermons, even today's sermon, we sit and talk through a lot of ideas there. And she's a huge help um, making, of helping me organize my thoughts. And it helps make my sermon better. So my wife has the gift of teaching, and she finds many different avenues to use that gift, even though she's specifically not speaking up here from the pulpit on a Sunday morning. So if women can't be pastors, elders, or deacons in our church because of Scripture's mandate, what can they do? Do we see women around here work, do a serving? Absolutely. We have women here at PBC that serve, they lead our songs, play on our worship team, pray, read Scripture, give testimony to what God has done. We have women that are part of our ushering and greeting teams, our AV teams, assisting their husbands in connect groups. And that's not even to mention the many ways that our ladies serve outside of the worship service, in our women's ministries, children's and youth, missions, and many other ministries here at PBC. Women have such a huge, dynamic part of our ministry here at PBC. And hear this, our edification and building up of the body would not be the same without them. Hear that again. Our edification and building up of the body would not be the same without them. Well, once the biblical principle of a woman's role is established in a church, the actual practice may vary. Much of an individual church's decision may depend on the, upon the culture. 
both the culture of the church and the society around it. As I say that, there's also two extremes that we need to avoid, that church leadership needs to avoid. One, compromising biblical teaching to give in to the surrounding society. Example, because our society wants to assert that there is no difference in roles between men and women, many churches have changed their view on women preaching. On the other hand, number two, we might create restrictions that are beyond Scripture's teaching. We quench the work of the Spirit of the church bo- in the church body. I read a story <laughs> this week of a church that didn't sing some hymns because they're written by women. Songs, so songs like Blessed Assurance, To God Be the Glory, were omitted from their worship service because they were written by Fanny Crosby. They believed her hymns taught doctrine, and because she was a woman, they could not be used in a worship service. If we go to this extreme, we miss out on some of the thoughts, insights, and gifts that the Holy Spirit has given throughout the ages. So why can we sing songs that are written by women? Or why can we allow women to use their gifts and participate in the worship service? Because there are elders who have had the responsibility and authority to oversee and determine what is scriptural and what is not. And in the end, the church will never be held in high regard by society because of the underlying biblical principles of male headship and woman submission. In our American society, these principles are a stumbling block and will continue to be so, especially as our culture continues to move toward a more godless society that defines its own sets of standards regarding men and women. Now let's move from the church to how does this apply to us individually and how we can resist the lies of our culture and turn to the truth of God's plan for men and women. Well, it all starts in our hearts. On an individual heart level, for both men and women, We all bristle at the idea of submission. It is one thing to willingly grant you authority over me, provided that I believe it is helpful. It is an entirely different thing to submit to you just because of your position. The bottom line is we each want control of our own lives, and we don't want to submit because we ought to. We submit because we believe it will be to our own advantage. Well, our hearts must admit that submission is required when we come to grips with the true gospel message. If God sent Jesus to die for my sin and offers me salvation, what right do I have to withhold from God full submission of my will? Jesus himself, who was perfect and holy in every way, submitted himself to the Father on the way to his death on the cross. His words to his heavenly Father were this, Not my will, but thy will be done. Do we echo the same prayer in our hearts? Then Jesus explained what it looked like to follow him in Mark chapter 8. If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. If we want to be a true follower of Christ, walking daily with him, we must live a life of submission before him. And Jesus doesn't ask us to do something that he didn't do himself. His entire earthly life was a life of submission to the Heavenly Father. Listen to these verses in Philippians chapter 2. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, but rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Jesus lived out submission perfectly. How much more will he enable us to live out the roles he calls us to, both men and women? So as we close, I believe this passage is Paul's way of correcting the Corinthian church and reminding them of their role of representing God's design for men and women. It's a beautiful picture of equality. They both have worth, and each is playing a specific role. The men leading and the women willingly surrendering or submitting. This is God's way. It's God's design, it's God's original idea.
And you know what? We reflect him most when we live out God's plan. To God be the glory. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And uh, we know your word is truth. And I know sometimes we read your word and, man, there's some challenging places there. (laughs) But we know (laughs) it's right. And so, Lord, we know it's hard to live out. And I pray, Lord, as we take these words to heart, the idea of submission for all of us to you is, is a challenge and a struggle. But, Lord, we do thank you for the order that you created and the design that you created, Lord. And you know, I pray that you will help us to live out that design in a world that does not promote it. So, Lord, go with us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.